Um, today's teaching text comes out of the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Well, good morning. So how many of you, as you grow older, have become more hopeful and trustful by nature? You know, that you just have this sense, as, as you've gained life experience, that, that people are going to do the things that they say they're going to do. You can trust them. How many of you feel that way? Yeah, the chuckles say it all. I think that cynicism is one of the great gifts that age bestows upon you. Uh, in fact, it, it seems like nobody keeps their promises anymore. You know, all the promises made during election seasons, like where are they now? Sports stars make promises, and we find out about scandals behind the scenes. Spouses make promises in marriage, and they betray them. Children make promises to their parents, and they break them, or so I'm told. Um, people that you're dating, they cheat on you. They can't even keep just the loose promises that they've made. Employers break promises to employees. Employees make, break promises to their employers. We live in a culture of broken promises, and oftentimes, as a result, we, we just get kind of jaded. We become cynical. And so when you come to church, and that's the, the default state of your heart, and then someone stands up on the stage and says, I've got good news. God has made promises for your future. Sometimes we import that, that cynical attitude. We say, well, yeah, I guess it's ultimately true, like on a meta level, but it's not something that I'm ever going to experience personally. Or, or maybe God's disappointed you before. You know, maybe something happened in your life, and, and you're just like, yeah, if there is a God, I don't, how could he do that? Or, or, or perhaps you actually, you're confident, you know there's a God, and you are mad at him. You know, how could he let this terrible thing happen to me? Well, we all, we all get disillusioned. We all get disappointed. And um, we're, we're now in a series on identity. We're, we've been in it for a couple weeks. And, and what Paul is attempting to do in this passage here is important because he, he's attempting to move us away from our cynicism and push us towards hope. And so it's not just a hope through theology, but it's a hope through an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And this is what he's trying to do in this last section of this, this song, this doxology that, that we've been working our way through. And, and so God is making a promise through the Holy Spirit about our salvation. And this is one of the richest claims in Scripture. And so the first week, we talked about the Father's role in salvation, how he's, he's chosen us, he's adopted us. Last week, we talked about Christ and, and all that he has done for us, the work that he's done, that our identity is rooted in Christ, and that we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. Today, we're going to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in salvation and how this fits into our identity. And so Paul, as he's writing this, he wants us to know that, that the Father has a plan, that the Son is the means by which the plan is executed, but it's the Spirit that makes it real to you. That the Spirit is the lived encounter of God in your life. Now, this has nothing to do with being Pentecostal or, or charismatic. This is just about being Christian, being a follower of Jesus. This is the promise of the Father. 
And so this passage has three main ideas about the role of the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and I want you to get this because this is not just something that Paul writes to people thousands of years ago for them. This is for us. This is for you today, wherever you work, you, you know, wherever you live, whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, whatever struggle you're working through, whatever you're wrestling with, this is what the Holy Spirit has done for you and wants to do in you. And so Paul says that when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. See, one of the things that I think we all tend to struggle with when we begin to follow Jesus is that our, our life before uh, wasn't necessarily marked by godliness. You know, in fact, for some of us, it actually took several years for this to take root and, and for us to, to really start living out this faith that we have. And so as we reflect on our behavior, our interactions, and, and our relationships, we carry this profound sense of shame. If people knew what I'd done, if people knew how I lived, if, if they saw how I behaved at that party, and so we feel like our lives are, are destined to be marked by shame, by our mistakes, by the things that we regret. And I just thank God that I went through this before, like YouTube and cameras on cell phones, because I did some profoundly stupid and embarrassing things. But, but we often have this sense that, that our lives are going to be defined by shame, it's going to be the worst things that I've done that people remember me by and not the good things. That, that's the default human experience. We carry our shame. We carry our guilt. We feel like our lives are, are marked by failure. But what the Holy Spirit does is he marks us, not by shame, but by grace and by love. And the Father, he comes along and he marks us with his spirit. He doesn't see shame. He sees the spirit. And so when we talk about being marked by the spirit, there are four things that this means. There's four things that the apostle Paul is, has in mind as he's talking about being sealed by the spirit and being marked by God. And so here's a picture of kind of what we're talking about. And it gives you an idea of the seal that, that Paul is referring to. It's a, a wax seal, and, and it's usually marked by some kind of signet or, or a ring. And, and so what the Holy Spirit is doing is he's marking us with a metaphorical seal. We're not getting physically branded here, but it's, it's not unlike this seal and what it does. The first thing of the four, is it gives us security, that our salvation will be completed, that, that he's the one who sets his seal upon us. And so when, when goods were about to be plundered or, or traveling through the Roman Empire in the first century, a, a rich leader or a government that would, would put a seal on their goods. And so knowing that the penalty for stealing was often death, uh, people would go to plunder the goods, they'd, they'd get ready to attack, they'd see the seal, and they'd go, ooh, yeah, I don't want to mess with the empire, and they would turn away. They wouldn't steal. And so when we're sealed by God, we are marked as his, and it gives us a great security that we belong to God, and those that come against us actually come against him. The second idea is that of authenticity. That it's attaching a sense of, of genuineness to it. So I don't watch a lot of daytime television anymore, but I remember growing up during the summer, you know, we would, before like binge watching was a thing, it would just be like reruns of terrible old shows, but we'd be watching television, you know, all day long essentially. And there would always be these commercials that would come on for commemorative coins. Have you seen these? 
You know what I'm talking about? Like, these are coins that were issued to, to remember a special event or, or maybe a certain issue that was prominent. And so you've got everything from, like, bicentennial quarters to um, some different type things, like the Seoul Olympic dollar or the Mount Rushmore half dollar or, very impressive, the Christopher Columbus quincentenary collection, which included half dollars, full dollars, and special $5 gold coins. So do you know what these always came with? A certificate of authenticity. So this was proof that the coins that you are purchasing are indeed legitimate. They're the real deal. And so what God does when he seals you is he's authenticating your salvation. What an incredible truth. Because I don't know about you, but I mean, sometimes I just feel like such a fake. I just feel like such an imposter. But that's not how God feels about me. He's actually marked me, independent of my feelings, independent of my shortcomings, as someone who has an authentic salvation because it doesn't depend on my performance. It depends on his grace. The, the third thing when we talk about being marked or sealed is ownership. And, and so in the first century, people would mark their belongings with a seal. And it's not unlike when I drop my kids off here at base camp. You know, we get to church, we put our phone number in, we check them in, it spits out a little receipt, a little little label, if you would, and they do worship, they, they learn about Jesus, it's a great time, but, but we get this label, and the label says on it, Todd, which is my last name, in case you didn't know. I know, two first names, it's odd, but Todd. And this was actually way more important to me when they were little, like toddlers, you know, because like the thought of someone coming into the classroom and taking my kid, like, ooh, it really bothered me. Now, you know, I'm like, good luck, dude. Like, if you want to take them, like, they're nuts. You won't even get them out of the building. Um, they're, they're crazy in an endearing way. You know, you've seen them, I'm sure. Anyways, um, these boys are marked. They are Todd boys. And no one else can pick them up but me and my wife. They belong to us. And this is God's approach in the world. He loves everyone, yes. But, but to those who bear his mark, those are children. And the spirit is the seal. It, it shows that we belong to God. The last of the four things is it's a, it's a sign of authority. It, it's a designation of office or it's a, a or a state service. So I used to be a notary public. I don't I don't know if any of you are notary publics. If you are, I, I pray for you. My prayers are with you. I hated it. It was miserable for me. I would always get like into these really terrible situations. It's like a divorce battle or a custody thing. Uh, you know, property disputes, court stuff. I don't know. And, and but what I always found interesting about the whole notary thing was that for some reason. My signature meant something. Their signature, their word, just, they're just sitting on the other side of the table. Like, it didn't, it didn't cut it. it. It didn't mean what my signature did. And I had this, you know, little stamp with a seal, and it meant something. I had some authority. I had the authenticity. Somehow I had proven that I could be trusted. And so what Paul is saying here is, he's saying, you have full citizenship, you have full identity, you have full standing in the kingdom of God. You have the authority of a son or a daughter of the king. And the Holy Spirit is your mark, your seal of, of authority. And so when God looks at you, this is how he sees you because he's put his spirit inside of you. So you're not marked by shame. You're not defined by your mistakes. You are defined by his spirit that the Father has placed within you. 
And by the way, if you were in the first century, you're living in the first century, and you're a Gentile, like this is extraordinary news. If you're living in the Roman Empire and you are not a citizen of Rome, this is incredible news. Think about an undocumented immigrant today. They live in perpetual fear that someday, someday they'll be found out and they'll be deported. But when you enter the kingdom of God, you have full standing. You have full citizenship. You have nothing to fear. And this is what Paul wants them to know, that you belong, that the Spirit has marked you, that he has sealed you. The second thing that we see in verse 13 is, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. But he uses a phrase here, the promised Holy Spirit. See, there was a promise in the Old Testament that a new covenant would come. And that new covenant would give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And everything would change. Everything about the new covenant is better. It's like slap a new and improved label on it. The, the new covenant is, is better. It, it's, 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 it's improved. It's, it's something different. The old covenant is, is obsolete. It's, it's fading away. And, and Jesus would talk repeatedly about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so in John 14, he says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you, and I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In John 16, Jesus talking again, he says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. For your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, I don't know about you, but I, 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 I kind of struggle with this. I just struggle to believe that, that it's, it's better to have the Holy Spirit than to have Jesus himself. And so I, I want to ask you a question to kind of illustrate this. So we have two options today. We have a guest speaker, Jesus Christ, and he'll come and he'll preach the gospel. Or you can have me with the Holy Spirit living in me. What do you choose? Like, I, laughter, really, guys. No, I think we'd all agree. Jesus is, is the choice here. It's obvious. Or would you like to spend your quiet time or your devotional time, like, really in a book and, and knowing that the, that the Holy Spirit's there and, and kind of, you know, prompting you and, and speaking to you through that process? Or would you like to sit and have coffee with Jesus and ask him questions and, and, and let him speak these truths right to you. Like, that's my instinct. But, but Jesus is actually saying that God can do more through the Holy Spirit than if he were physically present with us. Like, do we really believe that? And, and this is the case that Jesus making, is made, and, and Paul is making it as well. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. That you are the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. You are the temple in which he resides, this, this promised Holy Spirit. And one writer put it this way. I think this is just so, so great. He says, the Holy Spirit must be understood as the direct presence of God. And wherever the presence of God is, people change. 
Lives are transformed. We're convicted of our sin. We become holy. We are a new creation. I mean, we are so messed up that God had to put a counselor inside of us. We are so weak that he had to put power inside of us. We're so helpless that he had to put a helper inside of us. But he did this out of love. In the Old Testament, do you know what would happen if someone approached the Holy of Holies? You know, the, the, the place where God resides. Do, do you remember what would happen? Fire would come down from heaven and consume them. The, the high priest, he would, he would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And when he went in, he had to wear little bells all over his, his outfit so that they could hear him moving. Because if he acted inappropriately in the presence of God, he would be struck down. And so the bells stopped ringing, and they had a hook that they could just reach in and pull him out. You didn't mess with the presence of God. Yet in the New Testament, in this new covenant, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, we are made so holy that the Holy Spirit actually lives in us. Like because of the Holy Spirit's work, we are made so holy that we become the holy of holies. We are the place where God dwells. And so I wanted to give you just a short list of what the Holy Spirit does. So this is not exhaustive by any stretch, but just a few of the things that the Holy Spirit does. He regenerates us. He restrains, convicts us of sin. He sanctifies, seals. He's a source of fellowship, the source of liberty, the source of power, the source of unity, the source of gifts. He teaches us. He calls us to ministries. He gives divine revelation. He empowers. He fills, guarantees, guards, helps, illuminates, indwells, intercedes, produces fruit, and provides spiritual character. Like all of this is available to you. That is the promise of the Father. And so we are marked and we are sealed by the promised. Holy Spirit. Third point, the Spirit guarantees our redemption. In verse 14, it says, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance? He's talking about the Spirit. He's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And so this idea has just such a rich semantic meaning in the first century. It's it's the idea of a pledge or a promise. It's it's a concept of down payment. And so it had a pretty broad range of meaning. But one of the things that this was understood to mean was it's actually the the same type of a deposit as an engagement ring. And this is, is one of the richest biblical metaphors. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take you uh, on a trip down memory lane. So uh, this is Lauren and I. We're we're just engaged. Uh, For those of you that don't know us super well, so we've been married or we've been together off and on for about 18 years. And we had a little two-year hiatus in the early stages. That's for another day. Um, But in this picture, so she's just turned 23 and I'm like 26. I know I look 12, but it's like a super manly 12, so I've got that going for me. Um, Anyways, at this point, uh, I had actually already been through a pretty rough divorce, and so I I had a bit of baggage, you know, going into the whole relationship, and when we first started dating, Lauren was actually rather eager to get married, and for some reason, I had reservations. I don't know. Um, but I remember before we were engaged, I, I, I was very explicit, and, and I just said, hey, you know, uh, like marriage is, is on the table, like I, I'm, I'm for that, but I want you to know I will not propose to you until I'm actually certain that I'm ready to get married. 
and I was extremely clear about this, um, but it, this was a bit frustrating for her. Uh, you know, she, she wanted to get things started, but this is, this is kind of where we stood on the issue. Well, I did such a great job of this that, that the day that I proposed, it was her 23rd birthday. And, uh, you know, I had this whole, like, elaborate scheme planned out. Um, you know, I've messed up a lot of things in our relationship, but I got this right. You know, I rented a car. You know, we went down to Colorado Springs. I had, you know, people involved, Pat and Winnie are doing things. Like, it was a big, it was a big deal. I went all out. But I did such a good job uh, of making it clear I wasn't ready. She had no idea a proposal was coming. She was just like, oh, wow, he really... You know, he's doing my birthday big. Okay. And um, so that day, I, I was so clear about this, that, that that day at lunch, she's lamenting over why, why can't we get married? Like, uh, I don't understand. And, you know, I've got a ring in my pocket. Like, I'm ready to go. She has no idea that this is coming. And, and it was all I could do to just be like, um, well, you know, I said, um, you know, keep a straight face, keep a straight face. I said I would do it when I'm ready. And, and you know what? Like, uh, when I do it, I'll be so ready that you could marry, we could get married on the spot. Like, that's how ready I'll be, but I can't do it until I'm ready. And so um, she had no idea it was coming, but that afternoon was, was quite the surprise. And so we got a uh, next picture. This is the place. That, that we got engaged, that's the day that we got engaged, it's Seven Falls in Colorado Springs. And um, you know, what I'll tell you is this, she, she had a lot of questions for me leading up to that day, but she never from that point forward questioned or doubted my intentions towards her. She, she never wondered how I felt. She never was like, well, why can't we get married? Or is this really going to happen? Is he going to come through? Like, there was no doubt, no question in her mind because I had, at that point, proven myself to her. And the day that we got married, it, it was incredible. You know, the doors of the church open. And she's walking in, and I think her dad was there. I don't know. I don't remember. I just, I saw her. And that day changed my life. I mean, that's a great love story. Like, I lived it. I can tell you. Like, that is a legit love story. Ask my wife. But that is nothing compared to God's passion for you. The, the spirit is in you. It's literally an engagement ring for you as the bride of Christ. And, and so whatever human love I have for my wife, and it is a lot, it pales in comparison to God's passion for you. And so if someone says to you, like, okay, tell me about your God, you know, where is he now? Is he really going to come through? Do you really, do you really believe this? If you understood how God has proven himself in my life, you wouldn't ask me that. He is going to come through for me. This is the God of the universe there's this really interesting uh, compound word in the Greek that Paul uses. I don't know why I'm going to try to pronounce this for you, but here we go. Eklerathemen. It's not bad, actually. I butchered it in first service. Um, so when something in the Greek, when something was so certain in the future that it couldn't possibly fail to happen, the Greeks would actually talk about it as if it had already occurred. Like, they're so sure of it that they would talk about this in the past tense. And so this is what Paul is doing here. He's actually so sure that God is going to come through for you that he writes about this as if it's already happened. It's in the past. We know it's in the future, but it's such a guarantee that I'm writing about it as if it's already occurred. And so the Holy Spirit, 
He has sealed us. He is indwelling us as the the promise of the Father. And he is the deposit. He's God's engagement ring for the full redemption of salvation. So how do we access this? That's that's an important question. How how do we access this? Well, the, the key to accessing all the fullness of the Spirit is actually in Christ. It's in the message of the gospel. It's believing it's true. And I know a lot of times, you know, people get a little nervous when we start talking about the Holy Spirit because you think, okay, this is where we're going to go off the deep end here. But, but here's the truth. As we're focused on Christ, it activates the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And if you don't believe me, Jesus says as much. In John chapter 7, Jesus says this. He says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the Holy Spirit loves to highlight Jesus and Jesus loves to pour out his spirit in response to these things. And a lot of people today are suspicious of spiritual activity. You know, they go, ah, I don't want to go to a church that's like too enthusiastic, you know? Like, I like good worship, that's important, but if it gets like too emotional or, you know, people get too excited about it, that's, that's a little too much. And I actually remember growing up in church and going with my mom to to various church environments and some very charismatic environments feeling the exact same way. Like, ooh, yeah, that's, that's too much. I don't know. That seems a little off. But here's what I've learned. If people don't drink of the spirit in church, they will drink of the spirit of every other worldly experience. You go to a concert, people are going crazy. You, you go to one of those like Tough mutter or uh, Warrior Dash things, like for some people, that's worship. You see people's Pinterest boards and it's just like they're creating the life that they wish that they had. That can be worship. You know, one secular writer wrote this. I, I think this is really profound. He said, we are suffering today from a psychic claustrophobia within the scientific worldview, which the human spirit cannot breathe. The materialistic world of objective science is not nearly spacious enough for the human spirit And here's the key. Without transcendence, the person shrivels. You are a spiritual being with holy longings. And you will drink from something. If you don't get the spirit from Jesus, then then you'll try to get the spirit from every other experience you have in the world. Drink from Jesus and the good news of his gospel. So two closing implications here. Um, The first, when it comes to your salvation, you should have a great assurance. You should be walking around bordering on spiritual cockiness. Like just based on what God has done for you in Jesus. You should have a confidence that that people are almost intimidated by this relationship that you have with God. You have a father who chose you before the world began. He included you in his plans. You have been adopted. You're part of his family. You have been redeemed by Jesus. His spirit 
has marked you. You have been promised an eternity. You have a guarantee of a future. You are not a slave to your circumstances. You're not defined by your failure, but you are defined by your future. We should be walking around a little differently than we do. Our salvation is not dependent on your performance. The, the extent of, of our feelings or how well we think we are doing. It's not about how well we cling to God, but about how well God clings to us. He has the power to do what he has promised. So don't think that delay is the same thing as denial. You have a great assurance. And sometimes you just have to wait until the time is right. Just ask a 26-year-old who's gone through a really painful divorce. And the last thing, if there's a, a running theme of this doxology, these last three weeks that we've been, been going through, this 202-word conglomeration of words in the Greek... If there's one theme of it, it is God's great love. We are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The Father chose us. The Son redeemed us. And the Spirit brings all of this to life in our hearts. This is a praise cry of God's great salvation for you. If you doubt it, bring your doubts to him and drink. If you believe it, revel in it, enjoy it, give him praise for it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, respond to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that, that God loves you, that God will forgive you, that Christ has died for you, that he's overcome sin and death for you, that he's risen, and he invites you into his family. Respond to that. Let's pray. Well, Lord, um, we just come before you humbled by the work that you have done, by just the, the intricacy of your plan for our salvation, that, that you did all of these things, not because we're great, not because we deserve it, not for any reason other than the fact that you wanted to and you love us. And it's out of that great love that you have chosen us, that you've adopted us, that, that you have taken these poor paupers and, and placed them into your family, into your household, so that we would know riches that far exceed anything we could ever experience apart from you. That, that the means by which you chose to do this was the gift of your son, that he would sacrifice everything, that he would, he would give up heaven and his throne to come humbly as a suffering servant, that he would die in our place, that he would pay the price for our sin so that we would know you. And as he left, as he went back up into heaven, he didn't just leave us. We, we, we aren't just here on our own waiting for the day. But you've given us your spirit to live within us, to, to mark us, to seal us, to give us an assurance of our salvation, to lead us, to guide us, to comfort us, to, to walk with us. That we would, we would have the power of the living God residing in us, transforming us from the inside out, making us holy. 
What a gift. What a joy. What... God, we are just overwhelmed by the love that you've shown us, by your goodness, by your favor. And God, our response is just praise. Thank you. Thank you. Amen.